uh, let uh, introduce um, let me introduce uh, Richard uh, Traxler, uh, who is com coming from the University of Zurich. I don't know what he is talking about, but he told me that he had something to say. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, yes, I have a title. Um, well, excuse me, oh, I'm, I'm a little confused here because my, my Macintosh... No, I will stand. I will not dance, but I will stand. Fine. Um, as you can see, I have a title, uh, Too Little, Too Soon, Too Much and Too Late, Some Observations on Medieval French Manuscripts on the World Wide Web. Thank you. Um, and I'll be giving these observations from my point of view, which is the point of view of a dumb philologist. I'm a medievalist dealing with Romance philology, so I'm actually one of those who is interested in not only what is in the manuscript, but what the thing that is in the manuscript might actually mean. So my uh, perspective is perhaps slightly different from um, some of yours, because I, um, I'm not concerned with database. I'm interested in database when I can use it. And um, so this is a series of um, reflections and ideas I have on uh, databases how they are and how they could be. Well, I'll present um, three. Um, yes, this is my computer and this is what you see, excuse me. Um, yeah. They wouldn't have put something like an arrow on a... On a... Questo qui. Great, two arrows, one forward, one back. Excellent, so uh, this is the stuff I will present. Uh, examples of medieval French databases. I'll be uh, looking at the Dictionnaire Ectomologique de l'Ancien Français, which is uh, elaborated in Heidelberg. I'll be giving a short look at the, we'll be having a short look at the Archive Littéraire du Moyen-Âge, uh, done by, um, basically one scholar, single man, in Ottawa, and then we will have a short look at uh, Jonas, Institut de Recherche de l'Histoire des Textes, which of course you are all familiar with, um, because it's the oldest and most important uh, institution dealing with that. So if you are a little bit familiar with, this, um, with these three institutions, and perhaps even their websites, you will know that only uh, one of them is actually dealing with medieval French manuscripts. That's Jonas. So the other two are actually not dealing with medieval French manuscripts. So you might be asking yourself, well, what's he doing here? Why is he wasting our time talking about stuff which has nothing to do with the conference? And that leads me to a series, to the first of a series of 12 axioms Axiom number one, on the web, information on medieval French... Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> that will happen a couple of times, okay? I count on you to say, well, when I'm not in uh, perfect synchronicity. Okay, axiom number one, on the web, information on medieval French manuscripts is not only where you would expect it to be. It is everywhere, but nobody knows where exactly. So that's, that's good news, basically. So there's more information out there than we are aware of. That leads to axiom number two, which is perhaps slightly less comforting. On the web, the places where you would expect to find information on medieval French manuscripts do not always contain the information that is available somewhere else and nobody knows why exactly. So, I'll give you a, sh a short example of the reasons that might account for this uh, fact. So, the uh, DAF, Dictionnaire Etymologique de l'Ancien Français, nothing to do with DEF, um, DAF contains um, 
a, uh, I don't know if you can actually see that. I can't even see what's on my screen. So um, you have, I, um, well, basically it's a dictionary, but you have also um, Ressources numériques, and then you can search the DF, and you can search in the bibliography of the DF. And that's a very interesting tool, because you can find information on manuscripts in that bibliography. So if you actually um, write the, the shelf mark of a manuscript, for obvious reasons we have referred to earlier this, Early today, I would um, not advise you to write anything else than a shelf mark because if you write the name of an author or the name of a title, you are likely to get r no answer or wrong answers. So write a shelf mark and you will be finding some information. So let's see, if you write, let's say, 12,603, if you write 12,603, you will be getting this kind of information. That doesn't help you enormously, but it gives you a list of um, texts which are contained in this manuscript, 12,603 of the French National Library in Paris. And if you have very good eyes, you can see here the shelf mark, and then between square brackets, some minor information which is absolutely capital to a philologist as me. It says P-I-C, which would mean from Picardia, and it says circa 1300, which would be a date for this manuscript. Okay, so why are these people in Heidelberg capable of giving us this kind of information? on the manuscript, because they work on the texts and they have a close look at the um, <coughs> lexicological aspects of the text and thanks to the text they can uh, date fairly precisely and localize fairly precisely a manuscript. And that's what they do and they do it really well. So let's keep that in mind, we have a date and we have a localization for this specific manuscript. That leads us now to our next axiom, which would be axiom number three. On the web, information, oh, sorry, I forgot to give you one small detail, which would justify the axiom. Um, yeah, of course, um, these people at Dea, they would make more precise observations if they look closely at the manuscript. So, ideally, their information would be more uh, accurate if the manuscript they are looking at is also the base manuscript of an edition, which is the case in um, number 12 and number 3. Le Chevalier à l'Épée and Le Valet qui baise à Malaise, ce mais, are conserved in this manuscript only. So this would be the base manuscript, so that would give us a guarantee that what they are saying on the localization and dictation of this manuscript is probably fairly accurate, because that's what they do, that's their job. So here they have um, evidence to uh, work on. So this now leads us to axiom number three. Axiom number three says that on the web information in medieval French manuscripts can only be understood by a full professor for medieval French literature. It takes inside knowledge to evaluate what you are seeing from the outside. Because only somebody who is aware of that will be able to um, actually appreciate the, um, the fact of the information being either extraordinarily accurate or completely wrong. So I, in my case, because that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years, I know that the, the guys in Heidelberg do good work, that Wolfgang Müller is accurately uh, localizing, localizing and uh, dating manuscripts on the basis of the um, vocabulary used in those um, manuscripts. So I 
I know that I can use this basis. I'm telling you. So, but uh, if you come from the outside and if you look into a domain or into a discipline which is not actually yours, you will be lost. Okay. Let's go on now with uh, Arlima. Arlima is a very um, um, interesting enterprise for uh, those who are not familiar with it. Arlima, Archive Littéraire du Moyen Âge, is, has, has been created more or less single handedly by a, um, a young scholar of Swedish origin. He uh, works in Canada and he just had the idea of creating something like a Wikipedia for medieval French texts and he has been doing so quite success successfully and a few friends stepped in, gave him a hand and so it actually works. Uh, the scope of Arlima, once again, is not to provide information on manuscripts. Uh, the scope is entirely different. It uh, gives you information and bibliography on um, medieval texts, literary texts, essentially, and authors. But they also have a section uh, regarding manuscripts, and it's actually um, quite, uh, quite well done because he does not uh, have the ambition to add much information, he just um, compilates information which is already available. So, um, for instance, here we have a section, manuscripts, where you would find the manuscripts according to the country, according uh, to the uh, uh, deposits, and um, for each deposit, you would have what you can find on the web, uh, mostly Gallica, the catalogues of those um, specific libraries. So that's quite useful. You actually have access to the uh, document you are interested in. And then, and that's the part we will be talking about in a couple of minutes, you have also a couple of um, um, manuscripts which are separately uh, listed and we will be looking again at um, uh, 12,603 in a couple of moments. So this is uh, Arlima and uh, Jonas, which you of course are familiar with, is the, um, um, the um, database of the IRHT, which is the uh, perhaps the most ambitious and the most uh, uh, professional of these. Um, and they deal with uh, manuscripts, so you can um, enter um, a shelf mark, enter a city, enter a deposit, whatever, and you will um, be led to a page looking like this, where you will have, we'll be talking about it in a moment, uh, something uh, on the date, something on the language, and uh, some, some uh, additional information. Um, this is... Um, absolutely unfair, of course, what I'm doing here, especially in the presence of Nicole Berriou, because um, this is a fiche, oui, um, état de la saisie en cours, so this is not definite material, and that's, well, good and bad at the same time, because of course all the errors uh, which are contained in the saisie at this stage will be corrected eventually and very soon, I believe, and so that's an excellent example. Uh, for us to see how things can be done can, or how they cannot be done. Uh, yeah, so we will be now looking at one manuscript, um, which is the manuscript 12603, and we will be comparing what we find here. Um, well, it's very easy, and you will immediately find out why I picked this manuscript. Uh, there are two codicological, pseudo-codicological studies in the manuscript, one by Terry Nixon, and the uh, second one by me, it's an old uh, thing I've done, I was uh, still a child, but anyway, um, I had some information, so it was handy for me to start looking at the basis with uh, this uh, uh, information in my, um, on my hard disk. So what do we find um, on the dates, for instance, in these um, different um, uh, sites? Well, the database of Arima gives us following information. You can't read it if you're not in the front row, and even if you're in the front row, you will not see much. You will have um, 13th, 14th century, and then 
a reference to the source. First, which was the editor of one of the texts, a very early editor, then around 1300, another source, début 14e siècle, another so source, second half of the 13th century, and another source. Good. Uh, if we have the same, um, if we do the same thing for um, uh, Jonas, we find one information, 13e ou 14e siècle, and the reference to one source. So that leads us to axiom number four. A database, just as any scholarly work, is often tempted by two demons, the two demons of exhaustivity and precaution. Every opinion is registered in that way, the basis covers everything and says nothing wrong. So, the consequence of this is my, my axioms are becoming uh, progressively more uh, sarcastic and um, apocalyptic towards the end, you see. Um, a database, unlike any other scholarly work, is uncritical. You know, where, where, what kind of information is it? It's just compiling information, whereas, in my sense, the best information is already available at the uh, site of the Dictionnaire Etymologique de l'Ancien Français, which says around 1300 in Picardy. Um, here we have with this um, method of dating and compilating, we have a time span of 200 years. 200 years. And the work is already on the internet. You know, Möhren and his crew in, uh, in, in Heidelberg have already solved this. Okay, fine, so let's move on. Um, what have we here? Oh, content, yeah, content, that's interesting too, because that's one of the aspects I'm actually interested in. Um, because if we look at texts today, um, we are also interested in the textual environment, the context. So the list of content is, of course, uh, very um, welcome. And that also gives the, um, an idea of the complexity of the, um, of the listing you'd have to provide. Because these um, collections are sometimes very, um, very important and contain a great number of texts. So this is um, what Arima says on the content of um, 2603. Um, you have the list of the titles and you have sometimes the name of an author. Most of our texts are anonymous anyway. So sometimes you have a, uh, an author name like Chrétien de Troyes and sometimes you have some uh, information which is provided. And I would like to have a look at item number 17, where it says, this is a title, because it's anonymous, uh, W between two points, and then brackets, Bautier, and this would be the title of the particular piece. So the problem is that, in this particular manuscript, um, you only have W between two points, which is an abbreviation for any name starting with W. Well, it could be Vautier, but it could also be uh, Wistas or anything else. So, what is this leads us to the next axiom. A database, just as any scholarly work, can contain errors. Can contain errors. It can accidentally omit information that should be mentioned, or add wrong information. Of the two types of errors, the latter is worse. A database, unlike any scholarly work in print form, can spread wrong information in very short time spans. So, what actually happens here is that the um, the mention of item number seventeen. Vautier does not exist as that in the manuscript. It's a scholarly conjecture. So it is not the title of the uh, work that is, uh, as it is given in the manuscript, which should be stated at some point. So if we just um, mix 
in our database is information which is in the manuscript and information which comes out of the scholarly tradition. Of course, that creates a, uh, an awkward situation because the user of the database would not be able to uh, actually be aware of what he's dealing with. So let's see what um, Jonas says to content. There we have a <laughs> different problem. Um, yeah, you may see this item number 17. I will not uh, look at the others, which is the same. Huh? Fragment de Fabio W. So this time we do not have a, a title which is not in the manuscript. It just says W, but we have the name of an author, Mère du Hamel. So that leads us again to a an axiom would be number six. That's something we have talked on earlier today. Author names in a database of medieval manuscripts are a tricky thing. If you respect the actual form given in the manuscript, you will perhaps honor a hapax. If you don't, you will perhaps be occulting the real author. So the problem is that le maire du Hamet, we don't have a clue on who he might be, but on the other hand, we know somebody who's called Constant du Hamel. Now that's good because he actually wrote Fabio's. And um, this text happens to be a Fabio. So at some point there should be some reflection on the possibility of identifying Constant du Hamel with the Mère du Hamel. Mère might also be a type, somebody could think something. But anyway, uh, at some point we would have to link these two possibilities together. And... Um, actually um, draw the attention of the user of the databases to this possibility. So that was what we were saying this morning. Uh, we should um, multiply, uh, we don't need um, an, a normative form, but at least we should point in, in, in some direction so identifications could be made on the basis of what we find in the manuscript. And the, uh, the other thing, of course, is that the um, same only words applies to titles, you know, authors we can deal with, they have names, uh, most of the texts are anonymous and they all have so very generic titles, so that's a problem for us medievalists. And that um, leads us to a, another axiom, which, well, well it's something we discussed already, um, the problem is that if we use uh, a database and we um, rely on the form we have in a manuscript and search for that specific form in a specific database, it may, might work for one database but not for another. Because the database, uh, the other database would be based on a different manuscript and such would not mention the uh, Mère du Hamel. And the same thing of course is true for titles and that's the real problem. So, what kind of information do we find on bibliography? So, I, I, I told you earlier on, the uh, bibliography, the essential bibliography, on this specific manuscript consists of two titles. And, um, yeah, well, you find all references to older studies in those two titles. Um, yeah, so what do we have on Arima? Well, great, if you can read it, uh, you actually find the, the reference to Terry Nixon. It's not complete, but it's there. And you find the article uh, I wrote a couple of years back in Cultura Neolatina. If we now look at uh, Jason, uh, Jonas, sorry. Um, yeah, Jonas, we find the... Uh, we find even more. We find reference to newer studies, including one I, I, I wrote in two, published in 2010. So I was very intrigued when I saw that, so I had a look at it, and I do not mention, or well, I do mention one line, manuscript 12603, but it is not the codicological study of 12603. No, it is not. So, um, actually it will not be helpful. So, axiom number eight is bibliography of a database 
Just as any other bibliography, it is often obsessed by the double demon of being complete and up to date. Every title is registered, new ones are constantly added. In that way, bibliography covers everything and says nothing wrong. A database, unlike any other scholarly work, is uncritical and leads its users to waste time by quoting many non-pertinent titles and by spreading them quickly and without purpose. Axiom number nine. In a database of medieval manuscripts, new scholarly parameters are absent in order to avoid favoring research. None of the, we'll finish the axiom. A database, unlike any other scholarly work, is conceived as a place where information is deposited as opposed to a place that immediately generates questions. Well, it is significant that not one single aspect I'm interested in today um, regarding manuscript is treated in these um, databases. Well, what could somebody possibly be interested in looking at manuscript? Well, perhaps he'd like to know if there are bilingual manuscripts because he's interested in cultural exchange, linguistic exchange, things like that. Perhaps somebody would be interested in genre. I'm interested in Fabio, so I would like to be able to type Fabio, so I would get manuscripts containing Fabio, things like that. No, it's not. Well, of course, we are not even capable today of creating a basis which would be um, a common basis for author names. How can we even conceive the idea that one day we might um, agree, all of us, majority of us, on something so vague and so um, complicated as medieval genre? Presumably never. So, um, yeah, what are we doing with these manuscripts? What are we doing with these databases? Two more axioms. And as you see, things become worse and worse. Okay, um, axiom number 10. On the World Wide Web, databases of medieval manuscripts form a supermarket. The client picks his stuff without knowing what he's getting, choosing amongst products exhibited in a non-hierarchical way. It's like when you're in the supermarket. You see the products and you see, well, these cornflakes look great. But, hmm, these cornflakes look great too. Perhaps, hmm, I don't know. And that's where you click on your different databases and you don't know how, you don't know why, you're attracted by the layout of the page and you don't know what's inside. A database, unlike any other scholarly publication, is rarely signed individually as to facilitate the impunity of bad work and to demotivate people to do good work. Second to last. On the web, information in medieval French manuscripts can only be understood by a full professor for medieval French literature. It takes inside knowledge to evaluate what you are seeing from the outside. Never such a person will write a review of the database. In that way, the idea that it's just free stuff on the web, compilated from real scholarly work, can live on. So what I'm asking is that when you do a database, you, you add some scholarly input. And that scholarly input must be signed and acknowledged. In that way, the person who writes the entry will get the credit or the blame. And at that point, I perhaps will spend a week, because it takes about a week to go through this basic. I would perhaps write a review, and then people would know, having read my review, what I think of these databases. And you will, or we no longer will be airing in a supermarket, not knowing what we're getting. But as long as we are, are dealing with a situation where we just compile that's the state we are in. We're compiling, basically, information which is somewhere already available, but we do not compile everything. 
and sometimes compile, of course, we make some, some, some errors. We are, uh, we are not ahead of what we are aiming, uh, are aiming for. And so this is my last axiom, and I think I will never be invited anywhere um, again after this. Uh, well, independently of different contents and scopes, every database also looks uh, different and works different. This is a technical aspect. Uh, there are also more and more of them. In that way, no user can ever hope to become familiar with all of them. If we should manage internal modification of the layout or the generalized use of passwords can recreate the initial sensation of wanting to stick to what we already know. Thank you very much.